Let's see if you have your Bibles, get them out. First Peter 5. Are you guys all still with me? Yeah? First Peter 5, 5. First Peter 5, 5. I'm going to get there in just a minute. I have a deep, deep passion. Uh, one of the reasons why I love being a pastor, uh, one of the reasons why I love leading the community of people is because I have a deep passion to see believers who are healthy, thriving, and alive. Like, like what I want to see is believers that are healthy, that are thriving, and that are fully alive. But I think in the reality of that thing, as we move towards that, we realize that you just can't have any ingredients in your life and expect to get the result you want. Sometimes I think we say, I want to be healthy, and I want to be thriving, and I want to be fully alive, but we're not intentional about what we're actually putting into our life. We're not intentional about the ingredients. Intentionality with ingredients, with the right ingredients, is what leads to a life of health and freedom. Guys, listen, you can't just put anything in your life you want and expect to come out healthy, thriving, and fully alive. We tell, I, I tell the story of when I was in high school, I stayed home sick one time, and my mom, my favorite thing my mom makes is these chocolate chip cookies, and so I called her, I was like 15, I'm home, I'm bored, I said, Mom, I want to make these cookies. She said, no problem, the, there's a, uh, um, you can go get the recipe, it's in the, in the cabinet. So I go, and I follow the recipe, and when I, you know, and I make them in little balls, and I put them into the oven, but when they came out of the oven, they didn't look at all like my mom's cookies. Then, like, you know, my mom's cookies are light and golden and brown and fluffy, and these were, like, dark brown, super thin and crunchy, and you kind of taste them, and they're, like, super salty. So my mom comes home, and I'm like, Mom, your recipe didn't work. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like she's like, my recipe worked. I've been doing that for years. I'm like, whatever, Mom, I'm telling you, I followed it to the T, and it didn't work. And she goes, well, show me what you did. I said, well, you know, it, you know, the recipe's like two cups of, you know, flour and eggs and, and uh, chocolate chips and vanilla and sugar. So, uh, so I said, well, it said, you know, two cups of flour. So I said, I showed her. I said, so I went over. And we used to have, do you remember in the 70s, they had those like big Tupperware like containers, those green kind of Tupperware things. Um, I said, well, I went over and I got the flour and, and I showed her where I got the flour. And she said, Banning, that's not flour. That's baking soda. And I just put two cups of baking soda instead of flour and then, and then cooked them and they didn't come out. And this, is what, this is what I find with believers sometimes. It's, it's always so funny that they're so surprised. You know, they open the oven of their life. And they're like, why are these, why don't these look like what I think they should look like? And I'm like, well, because you can't put anything in it and just expect for the result that you want. It doesn't work like that. Like, there has to be intentionality to what I'm actually putting, what, what I'm putting into my life. I can't live any way I want to live. I can't do whatever I want to do and then be surprised when the result isn't what I want it. So because of that, if you were to come to our church, we are consistently pushing people towards a few things. And we would use some analogies around, you have to be intentional about the soil that you plant your life in. Because the soil, if you're going to bear good fruit in your life, if you're going to bear healthy, lasting, thriving fruit, then you have to pay attention to the soil that you plant your life in. And you can't just plant your life in any soil and expect to get good fruit. I remember I was in Vacaville. My uh, granny, granny who's still alive, 100 years old, my wife's granny, grew up in, grew up in um, one of the most amazing women I've ever met. She grew up on a farm in um, Vacaville. And until recently, their family still had the farm. And we were out there visiting her a few years ago. And I, I grew up in the suburbs, right? Like, so we get our fruit where everybody else does, at the grocery store. Like, I did not grow up with trees and farms. And, so we go to this farm, and, and I walk up, and there's this massive orange tree. I said, Granny, can I have an orange? She's like, yeah, I have as many as you want. So I go over, and I get this orange. And I'm not making this up. I, I will never forget this. I, I, I peeled this orange, and I took a bite of this orange, and it was the most incredible piece of fruit I'd ever had. It was, like, juicy and sweet and the right texture. It was the right everything. And I just remember, like, being so stunned. And I, I said, Granny, why is this orange so good? And you know what she told me? She began to describe the soil in Vacaville. She began to describe what type of soil it is and the mixture and the depth. If you want good fruit in your life, then you have to pay attention to the soil that you intentionally plant your life in. 
And what that means is this. And so we're consistently pushing people towards this. If you want to be healthy, thriving, you have to be planted in the soil of God's presence, in the soil of God's word, and in the soil of God's people. And any believer that is healthy and thriving, I'm telling you right now, you can trace back this, that they have planted themselves in the presence of God, they have planted themselves in the word of God, and they have planted themselves in the people of God or the community of God. And this issue of community is such a massive deal and something that we have to be extremely intentional about. You, you're not going to fall into these things. In fact, there is a war against these things. Don't think, the enemy, don't think the enemy wants you to thrive. So we have to be intentional about, I am going to plant my life in the right soil so that I can bear the right fruit. God's presence, God's word, God's community, God's people. When it comes to community, I, I'm going to read this. Let me just read this to you in, in 1 Peter 5, 5. 1 Peter 5, 5 is this. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. He's talking to young people. He says, listen, submit yourselves to your elders. But then he says, listen, then he goes, I'm going to talk to everybody right now. He says, yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Peter's writing, and he says, listen, you need to be submitted to elders, but he said, you need to be submitted and connected to one another. Yeah. Not, not just showing up at church on a Sunday, sitting next to each other, but there's this, there, there's this level of connection and intimacy through submission that has to happen, that he says this. One of the things you have to understand about community and why it's so important and why in many ways we're going to talk about this, it it is a countercultural thing that we're in, is is that Christianity works in the context of community. You cannot separate Christianity and community. And and it's very hard for us to understand because we approach Christianity and we approach the Bible with a very Western mindset. We have a very individualistic Western mindset. It, it's very like, it's just me and Jesus. It's just me and Jesus. That like, like even the fact that people be like, I just, you know, I do church by myself at home. Like this would be, this is a very Western concept that the Bible wouldn't even understand. In the culture, like it's it's just a very individualistic. Nowhere in Scripture does it say it's just you and Jesus. Nowhere in Scripture just go, it's just me and you, you don't need anybody else. It's the opposite of that. Yeah. Consistently, like this is, I need, like, the, listen to this. Let me just read this to you. Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. He's talking about communion, coming to God in communion. And he says this, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come offer your gift. I, I, like, you need to understand the soberness and the heaviness of that verse. We come to God and say, God, I've come to have communion with you. I've come to connect with you. I've come to bring my gift to you. And God says, hey, I want you to put this on hold for a second because you have a disconnect over there. God literally says, hey, I need you to put this on hold until you go fix that. Because he doesn't say, you know, it's just me and you. Your relationships with others don't matter. It's just me and you. He says, actually, your relationships with others do matter at such a level that I'm saying put this gift on hold until you go fix that. The community is not like the latest fad. It's not like we're sitting around going, hey, how do we reach this Gen Z generation that just wants to sit in coffee shops and talk all day long? And like, So let's do small groups and let's do this. This is the heart of God, and you cannot separate Christianity and community. And anytime you separate Christianity and community, just understand this. It's because we have an individualistic Western mindset that we are filtering our walk with God through. Yeah. Everything you need. God releases everything. Most things, I'm going to exaggerate that statement, most things that you need are found, are released through community. When I grew up, when I, when I, grew, I grew up in Reading, and so it was hot all the time, and we had lakes and rivers. So as a teenager, you would learn to drive a boat pretty quick. So I had a friend whose dad had a boat, and I remember when he first taught us how to drive that boat, the first thing he would tell us is this, don't ever start this boat outside of water. 
because don't ever start the boat outside of water. And we're like, well, why not? Because the engine, the boat was manufactured and created to sit in water because when it's in water, it actually draws that water up to cool the engine. So the very thing that it's sitting in is going to be the thing that cools the engine. So if you start the boat in the driveway, if you start the boat in the parking lot, the engine will overheat and fry quickly because it wasn't created, it wasn't manufactured, it wasn't built to be, to be run in a driveway. It was built to be run sitting in the context of water. In the same way as believers, what the, the very thing that we need, we get in the context of community. God sits us in community, and we draw from community the very thing we need to thrive as believers. We don't, we don't fully like thinking that because we don't like thinking that we need other people in our walk with God, but this is just how he created it. There are so many believers that are fried, burnt out, and they're wondering, like, why am I so burnt out? I'm like, because you're not in community. Because <laughs> the very thing that God wants to release to you comes through community, and you think that you should be out. You, you want Christianity on your own terms. You want to be able to say, God, I'd love a relationship with just me and you and nobody else. And he goes, it just doesn't work like that. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to give you three quick points just to kind of talk through why Christianity, like what God releases through community to us. But let me say this. One of the reasons why we struggle, one of the reasons why we avoid community is because flat out community is a struggle. Community is one of the hardest, most messy things you'll do. Which, guys, listen, if you're married, this, like, well, marriage is an interesting thing because marriage is this. I'm a, I'm a messed up person trying to figure myself out who is now going to marry a messed up person trying to figure themselves out. And then we're going to try to figure each other out while we're figuring ourselves out. I mean, my wife all the time is like, I'd love to know what's going on inside of you. I'm like, sweetie, I'll be, you'll be the first one to know. I don't know what's going on inside of me. <laughs> I'm not like withholding information from you. I have no idea what's going on inside of me. So how am I supposed to tell you what's going on? I say, I just want to know what's going on inside of you. I'm like, great, I'll tell you when I know it. I don't know what's going on. And so, so I'm trying to figure it out, and you're trying to figure it out, and then we're trying to come together and figure it out. And to think that that can't be messy, uh, that's, of course that's going to be messy. But this is where life comes. And so, so community, and this is one of the, one of the lies that we believed in the church, is that, is that a lack of struggle or ease equals good, and struggle equals bad. We believe this lie, that if it's easy, it's good, and if it's a struggle, it's bad. You know where we got that lie? America. <laughs> we got that lie from consumerism. Can I be the first one to tell you this? I love consumerism. I love consumerism. I like, I legitimately, I'm like, I go to other countries where they suck at uh, like cons uh, uh, at customer service. Like uh, if anybody's here from Europe or England or, or Paris, forgive me on this, but they're the worst. Like it's like you walk in and I'm like, am I inconveniencing you by spending my money at your, like, like it's like, uh, uh, am I a hassle for showing up to your business right now? But, but so I love that American consumerism thing. I love that people are sitting around trying to figure out how to serve me and trying to figure out how to make my life better. I love that there's entire departments at Google that are trying to figure out how to make my life better. I love that somebody came up with the idea of uh, you can just drive up and they'll bring their groceries out to your car. I don't know who did that, but I want to give them a kiss. Like this is, <laughs> like, I just love that they're like, how can I make life easier for you? See, consumerism is built around this. Consumerism is trying to remove the struggle trying to remove the struggle <laughs> they're trying to come along and say how can i make this easier for you i'm going to figure out what the struggle is i'm going to remove the struggle so it's easier so that you'll spend money here like staples has an entire uh you know the easy button which is hilarious because i'm like dude uh, uh go, go into uh uh <laughs> what are those stores called um what are staples and office depot Office supply, thank you very much. Uh, you get a gold star. Uh, 
I'm always like, man, office supply stores are so difficult. Like, you know, I've never thought that once, but Staples is like, this is super easy. And I'm thinking like, oh, if it's easy, I'm going. Like, did you make it easy? There's an easy button. I want all struggle removed when it comes to office supplies. But this is what it is. Like, there's whole things on it. If you, this is how, because they want your money. If you can imagine two coffee shops a block apart, and, uh, and, and one of the owners is in his coffee shop one day, and he sees a guy park a car, get out of a car, walk all the way up, stand in line, order a drink, wait for the drink, get the drink, and then go straight back to his car. It doesn't stay. It goes ba straight back to his car and leaves. And then he thinks, I could make it easier for him if I put a drive through him. I could eliminate part of the struggle by, not let, by saying, man, you don't even have to get out of your car to get coffee here. And now all of a sudden, people are buying coffee from this coffee shop rather than this coffee shop, not because the coffee's better, but because it's easier. Yeah. But because they eliminated the struggle. And then we come into church, and church is a struggle. <laughs> Community is a struggle. Believing God's a struggle. Giving's a struggle. And we're confused. We're like, why? Why is it such a struggle? Because everywhere in our life, people are trying, and, and, and honestly, as a church, we've done the same thing. We're trying to make life as easy as possible for you because we want you to come here. I'm going to make community as easy as possible. I'm going to make prayer as easy as possible. I'm going to, like, prayer. Prayer's a struggle. You know what? We're going to make it super simple. We're going to make it super easy. It won't really cost you much. It's not going to be much of a sacrifice. Uh, you know, giving to like, like we try to make everything as easy as possible. But here's the problem. Struggle is one of the main ways that you grow. <laughs> I mean this. Guys, if you're, if, you're, if you're coming to church and you're coming to Christianity thinking that easy is good and struggle is bad and that there should be no struggle, and if you're coming in so confused... People all the time, they're like, man, I, I just can't find community. It's hard. Yes. <laughs> what they're wanting is for me to make it easy for them. Yeah. Haven't, really found my, haven't really found anybody yet. Yeah. Welcome to community. <laughs> right? But I don't want it to be hard. I don't want it to be a struggle. I want you to fix that for me. That, the, that guy put a drive-through. Can I have drive-through community? Is that possible? Hey, guys, I, listen, I've been pastoring for a while. You, you may not believe me, but I am right. <laughs> People are like confused when there's struggle, when things take a little bit longer than they thought it would, a little bit more of a sacrifice than they thought it would be. And we don't realize that struggle is a part of your walk with God because it's one of the main ways you grow. And, and we have a whole generation of believers in the church that are just flat out immature because they've avoided the struggle. There's a story. That I got to get to my points. This is the all introduction. Um, I don't know if that's a good sign or not. Uh, listen to this. A man found a cocoon of an emperor moth. He took it home so he could watch it come out of the cocoon. On the day a small opening appeared, he sat and watched the moth for several hours as it struggled to force its body through the little hole. After a while, it seemed to stop making any progress. It appeared that it had gotten as far as it could and couldn't go any further. It just seemed to be stuck. The man, in his kindness, decided to help the moth. With a pair of scissors, he snipped off the remaining bit of the cocoon. The moth then emerged with ease. It had a swollen body and small shriveled wings. The man continued to watch the moth because he expected that at any moment its wings would enlarge and expand to be able to support the bloated body, which he was sure would contract soon. Neither happened. In fact, the little moth spent the rest of its life crawling around with a swollen body and shriveled wings. It was never able to fly. What the man in his haste had not understood was that, he, that the restricting cocoon and the struggle required for the moth to get through the tiny opening was nature's way of forcing fluid from the moth's body into its wings so that it would be ready for flight once it achieved freedom from the cocoon. Freedom and flight would only come after the struggle. Depriving the moth of this struggle, the man unwittingly deprived it of its health and its natural body. 
Let me just say this real quick, and maybe this is all you need to hear this morning, is that the struggle that you may be in, God wants to use to grow you. Don't associate lack of struggle with good and struggle with bad. Sometimes says, and this is what happens in community. This is one of the reasons people don't want to be in community. I'm about to tell you the benefits of community, but can we just stop and be honest for a second? Community is the hardest thing you'll do in the church. It's way easier to give money than be in communion. It's way easier to show up on a Sunday morning than be in community. Like, like community is the hardest thing that you're going to do. And you get into community, it's messy and it's hard and it's a struggle and it's not easy and you can't find it at first. And, and, and then we're like trying the best we can to slit, you know, make every hole bigger possible so you don't have to struggle. And can I just say this? Listen, that struggle is what's going to bring you to a place of maturity. I'm just telling you right now, the things that are costly are the most valuable. And I'll tell you right now, if, it, if that hasn't cost you something, maybe it's not worth anything. We, we have to understand this. The most, the most costly things are the most valuable. The hardest thing I've ever done is marriage. Well, the hardest thing I've ever done is raise teenagers. The second hardest thing is, is, is marriage. But, but, but those are the most valuable things in my life. <laughs> If you were to say, what's the most valuable thing? It's my marriage. It's my kids. And hands down, the most struggle I've had in my life. Do you know how much easier my life would be without a wife and kids? <laughs> She's not here right now. Am I allowed to say that? I have a great marriage. I love my wife. We've been married 25 years this year. So, so I, but, but, but you get it, right? I'm like, it is like, th th there's this thing of like, it's simultaneously the hardest thing I've done and the best thing I've ever done. <laughs> It's, hard, it's the hardest thing I've ever done and the most fulfilling thing I've ever done. And so, so we have to kind of break that lie in us yeah. that says, oh, I don't, I, don't, I don't want struggle. I've been there six months, still haven't found anybody to really connect with and just doesn't seem like, yeah, well. <laughs> okay, now you're quiet on me. <laughs> That's why you keep going. Right. You keep showing up to small groups. You keep going out to coffee. You keep jumping in to serve. You keep doing this thing. And, and, and we're, not a, we're not a people that are afraid of struggle. We understand that we live in a kingdom that is counter-cultural. God's not trying to get your money. He's not trying to make it as easy as possible so you'll keep showing up. This is what people do. Like, please, please come to my business. Please, please, please. I really want you to come spend money. Is there any way you could leave? And God, God's not in that mode. It's like, I'd love for you to follow me, but you're going to have to sell everything and take up a cross and surrender it all, and you're not going to have a home. And like, like, this is, like, Jesus has no problem saying that to us, right? Can I just say this? Jesus is not interested in your convenience. Is this too hardcore for this morning? I wasn't even going to go this hardcore, Tyler. I'm an overseer, so I have to be invited back. <laughs> so I like, but, but so, listen, let me just say this. Uh, my pastor Bill says this. God is not interested in your convenience. He's interested in your growth. God's not like, how can I make life convenient for you? He's saying, how can I grow you? Sometimes inconvenience is part of that. Okay, listen, here we go. I'm going to give you three things, but I'm only going to really talk about one of them. There's so much that God wants to release through community to you that when you are disconnected from community, and we get disconnected from community because it's inconvenient, because it's hurtful, because it's messy, because we're offended, because whatever. There's a whole, because we're, 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 we're afraid, because we have full of shame. There's so many reasons why we disconnect from community. But, but when we decide, I'm going to move towards community, there are so many things that God wants to release to us. First one is this, grace. This is the passage in 1 Peter 5, 5. Because one of, one of the most humbling things you can do is actually be in community. And therefore, when I'm not, this is, this is gonna sound harsh this morning. Can I just give you all a hug? I love all of you guys. Uh, but one of, the most, one of the most humbling things you can do is be in community. And one of the most prideful things you can do is not be in community. Yeah. Yeah. Is when I say, Tyler, I don't need you. I don't need you. I can actually do this on my own. I don't need you for my walk with the Lord. I don't need you in my life. And when I begin to say that, ultimately it's arrogance. And guys, this should sober you. God says, I resist the proud. I remember somebody saying, I'd rather have a thousand demons in hell resisting me rather than God. And so, so, so when I get into community, humility comes. But here's the beautiful thing. When humility is present, grace just starts flowing. Yeah. Grace starts flowing. Grace is a little bit like, um, 
This is what I say. Uh, living life without grace. Well, have you ever, my, my son, uh, when my kids were little, we used to do slip and slides. And like slip and slides when I was young, man, they were just like a tarp and we'd put some stuff down and just, it was amazing, so much fun. And then they get way more like sophisticated now. And they're like two lanes next to each other and like arcing water and a pool at the end. And I remember I'm in my 30s watching my kids just, just they go down, they just stretch out horizontal and just boom, fly down this thing. Looks so fun. But slip and slides are fun when there's water. They're a different experience if you remove water. Right? You're like, oh, that looks so fun. Remove water from the slip and slide. You know, and it's just, just ar, ar, ar. like it's just, and this one, listen, living life without grace is like going on a slip and slide without water. You want, you want grace in your life. <laughs> You want grace flowing. You want, the, you want the empowerment of God at your back. You don't want the wind of God at your, at your forehead. You want the wind of God propelling you, not resisting you. And there's something that happens when I humble myself that all of a sudden the empowerment of God, the grace of God begins to flow in my life. And I will tell you this right now. Many times people are like, dude, I just feel like there's so much resistance. And I'm like, that's actually God. If you will humble yourself, you will see a floodgate of grace begin to open in so many areas. Strength. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Oh, no, his voice. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one, but let me just say this real quick. One of the main ways God speaks is through people. I don't know if you understand. Do you know that? Like, obviously, the word of God is the final authority. The word of God is the, it, it is the authority that we submit to. There's no more books of the Bible being written. Scripture's not being added to. But, but listen, the, the, the Bible shows very clearly that God speaks through people. Do you know the nine gifts in, in 1 Corinthians 12? Listen, it's the manifestation of the Spirit is given to one for the profit of all. For one is given the word of wisdom, that's voice through the Spirit, to another word of knowledge, voice, to another faith, to another gifts of healing, to another the working knowledge, to another prophecy, voice, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, voice, to another the interpretation of tongues. Five of, those nines ha five of those nine are actually God using somebody and their voice. And, and, and so many times the gifts of the spirit are released. They're saying, listen, I've given a gift to him and I've given a gift to you and I've given a gift to her and I've given a gift. And when we come together, those gifts are in operation. So we want to say, well, I'm over here, and I, I don't know why. Why isn't the Lord speaking to me? Many times the Lord isn't speaking to you because he's put his voice in somebody that you're not connected to. This really, this really happens. I mean, guys, how many times in your life has the Lord spoken to you in some way through somebody else? Do not just a prophetic word, but encouragement. Or, and so many times when we disconnect from community, not only are we disconnecting from one of the main ways that God releases grace to us, but we're disconnecting from one of the main ways that God wants to release his voice and the gifts of the spirit to us. Like, you can't be by yourself and be like, uh, uh, um, I've got the gift of healing and I've got the gift of knowledge and I've got the gift. Of, it's just me. You know, it's like, like. He doesn't do that. He says, I've given it to you, and I've given it to you, and I've given it to you. And you know what it requires? For you all to come together. Yeah. For you to be connected with one another. Yeah. Yeah. All right, just for a second time. I'm just end with this one. Here we go. And, and can I say this real quick? Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. God actually speaks to you through imperfect people, and it's really hard. Uh, I remember one time um, I had three people over this kind of month-long period that got a hold of me and had some pretty harsh feedback for me. Two were outside the church. One was inside the church. And all three of them had horrible attitudes, and 95% of what they told me was wrong. But I could hear 5% of what they were saying. It was the Lord, and it drove me crazy. And I remember going to the Lord. I said, God... I said, I'm so frustrated right now. These guys have the worst attitude. That they're, they don't even have all the right information. And I said, um, I said, why do you keep speaking? But I said, I can hear your voice and what they're saying. And I said, why do you keep speaking to me in crappy packages? <laughs> we expect, we're like, God, you can speak to me through people, but here's what I need. They need to have known me for, I, they need to have known me for 20 years. They need to have phenomenal communication skills. Uh, they, I need to be convinced that they love me. Uh, they need to hold me gently. They, whatever. And, 
And, and, and we pretty much describe Jesus. <laughs> if they're Jesus, I'd love to listen to them. <laughs> he doesn't work like that. That's a side issue. But here's the last one. I'm going to end with that. Is, is that. is is that strength. Guys, listen. There is a strength found in community. One of the reasons why, one of the things that, the, the, in Proverbs it says this, he who walks with the wise will himself be wise. So, so when I walk with somebody, their strength becomes mine. If I walk with the wise, what I become is wise. The strength that's on their life becomes the strength on my life. And, and if I need wisdom, I can walk with somebody with wisdom and have wisdom. Wow. So many times, strength, we can have the worst team come up. Many times, strength is lacking in the lives of people because they are disconnected from community. And guys, we can do a whole series on why you're disconnected from community, but I just want to stir your heart on this thing, that community is one of the main ways that God releases things to us, and community is one of the main battlegrounds in our life because of the struggle, but we have to be intentional around this, and God wants to release strength. Listen, community is one of the most beautiful ways. I had... Um, I, I got invited to go, I, 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 I went for a long time every, uh, every year, every other year to this big youth conference in Colorado Springs. Is that a big church out there and they invited me that I'd come speak. And, and so one time they called me, uh, well, Corey Asbury, do you know Corey Asbury? He wrote Reckless Love. So Corey Asbury, he was the worst leader at the time. And, and he gets a hold of me and says, Banning, listen, uh, after your session on Thursday night, we're going to be putting together the first annual worship leaders versus pastors basketball game. <laughs> Are you in? And I'm like, uh, yeah, yes, I'm in. Absolutely. Let, yes, I'm in. Let's do this. And uh, so, so, you know, my number one, like my number one strength is competition. I'm like, this would be awesome. So then, and then Corey for the time lean up is just talking. It's just, he's, all, he's a great worship leader, just cocky. And just, just <laughs> chatting away and talking the whole time. So we get there. I get done with the service and God moved and kids were touched. And then we go 11 o'clock at night, altitude stupid. And um, are you the only worship person coming up? <laughs> oh, okay, that's fine. That's all right. You're awesome. Stay right there. I'll tell you when to start playing. Um, <laughs> I said, I'm like, worship team, worship person, come on up. Um, and so, so we get out to the first night. These are worship leaders. These are guys that wear like, you know, this at the time, two deep V-necks and two skinny jeans. And like, like we get out with them. And the pastors got killed, crushed. Like the worship leaders just killed us. I came home. CJ, my wife is like, how was the conference? I'm like, it sucked. It sucked. It was horrible. She's like, what did God do in the services? I don't know. I don't, I don't even know. But dude, it was so embarrassing. We just got killed in this, these basketball games. So they, about a month later, they get a hold of me and say, Benny, why don't you come back next year to speak? And then, and then Corey gets a hold of me and says, hey, we're going to play pastors, worship leaders again? I said, absolutely. I hung up the phone and got on the phone, and I called a friend who was the point guard for Cal. And uh, he just graduated just recently, and he was a point guard at Berkeley. And, and I, said, uh, um, I said, hey, Brandon, I've been thinking about you recently. And uh, <laughs> I said, you've been on my heart. He goes, oh, that's great. We're talking a little bit. <laughs> And I said, I said, hey, I said, I would love for you to come on a, on a ministry trip with me sometime. <laughs> he goes, he goes, I'd love that. I said, yeah. He goes, you know, I'm going to be in Colorado Springs this summer. And, oh, Brandon, God's doing good stuff with young people in Colorado Springs. <laughs> love for you to come. He goes, man, let's, I'd love that. He goes, all right, listen, why don't you bring your basketball shoes just in case. Maybe we'll get a run in. <laughs> so I'm not making this up. He comes with me. They, they, don't, know, they don't know who he is. He comes with me. And... Um, He's my armor bearer, <laughs> ministry assistant. And we're there to think, I get up that night. I don't even know what I spoke on. Didn't even matter. I wasn't there for the youth conference. I just got up. I'm like, Jesus loves you. Read your Bible. Don't give in to peer pressure. Uh, and then <laughs> it's about this game. We get to that game. We get there. We crushed them. I mean, one of the best nights of my life. Just, I don't even think I took a shot the entire game. It was just like, Brandon, you should shoot the ball. Brandon, you should go to the hole. Brandon, you should. I mean, we crushed them. I think we lost one game because a guy chucked in some three. Like, we, it, 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 uh, it was just, it was just the best. 
But here's what I realized. Who you show up with matters. <laughs> and see, I'm not an idiot. So I may get worked one time, but I have friends. I have friends that are ballers. Why would I show up again to the same thing where I got beat by myself? Why would I show up by myself when I have friends and I have friends that can play ball? And if Brandon wasn't available, I got a list of some other people I'm calling, telling them that they've been on my heart and they want to go on a ministry trip with me. Like, I, like why? I, I'm not an idiot. Why would I show up on my own? Why would I show up to that situation on my own? Why would I go get beat again when I've got friends and I can bring friends? Guys, one of the main ways that God wants to release strength to you. Listen, some of you right now, your marriage is in trouble and you've brought nobody into it. Your marriage is on the brink of divorce. Your marriage, you've struggled and you're trying to figure it out on yourself and you're trying to do it on your own. And do you know what you need to do? You need to invite people in. Don't do your marriage by yourself. Some of you are struggling with pornography. Your, your heart's to get free. You, want, you don't want to live that, but you just keep going back to that thing and you feel like you're just, you're just getting your butt kicked all the time. Why would you show up again on your own? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call. I got community in my life, and I don't show up to that stuff on my own. Some of you guys, your finances, you are in debt. And I get it. It's embarrassing. But there are people around you in community that the Bible says if I will walk with them, their strength becomes my strength. If I walk with them, there's a grace that begins to flow in my life that wasn't there before. Some of you, this is the absolute truth. The reason why you are getting, the reason why you're getting uh, defeated in areas is because you haven't humbled yourself in community to allow grace to come in and the very gift you need is on their life. There are people way smarter and way more anointed in finances than me. Why would I come to my finances on my own when I have community around me that are better than I am at that? And so I can humble myself. And when I humble myself, not only does that gift come into my life, but grace comes into my life. And all of a sudden, the wind shifts in my finances. All of a sudden, the wind shifts in my marriage. All of a sudden, the wind shifts in things that I've been fighting for because of community. Community is a struggle. It's the hardest thing you'll ever do, but you know what? It is the most fruitful thing. And if you want your life to be thriving and healthy, you have to be intentional. It's got to become a non-negotiable. I refuse to move off of this. I am going to move towards community. All the things that we set up, I'm assuming we have small groups. I'm an overseer. I should know that. Uh, uh, um, but, but small groups and serving and showing up to movie nights. Guys, this isn't like, oh, that's cute and that's fun. No, no, no. This is us moving towards community. Well, I just don't know anybody. Then show up to a, then show up to a movie night. Well, I just don't know anybody. Well, then serve. I just don't know anybody. Then go to a small group. Like, this has to be something in us. And when I say, when I'm, I'm just telling you, I promise you, the Word of God is true. If you humble yourself and move towards community, and here's the crazy thing. Some of us have community in some areas. We just don't open up other areas. Right. It's amazing to me how many people are struggling in their marriage and nobody would even know it. Wouldn't even know it. Some of you are in massive debt and nobody would even know it because we haven't really invited people in. I tell you what, sometimes, most of the time, it's the humility issue. It's, uh, sometimes it's like just inviting somebody in, even if they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> I just invited them in, and now grace begins to flow. Are you with me? I've gone way over. Stand up with me real quick. Come on. I'm going to turn this over to pastor, but... <clears throat> Guys, here's what I said from the beginning. You know what my heart is for you? My heart is that you would thrive. I want you to be fully alive. I want you to be healthy. I want, I want grace to be flowing in your life. But we can't have that conversation without saying, listen, this means that you got to go get in community. You got to get in the presence of God. You got to get in the word of God. But you got to go get in the community of God. And you've got to move. And you have to understand that it is countercultural on every level. And that there is going to be real struggle involved. And that's okay. Struggle is not bad. 
We just keep coming. We just keep coming. We just keep coming. And the Lord's going to do something. Father, so grateful. God, I'm so grateful for this community. God, you have sent this church at this time, in this season, in this region, because you want to set people free. Because you want to bring strength and the gifts of the Spirit, Lord. That this is going to be a community of people that strengthen one another. And I pray for everybody in this room right now that it's not, many of you in this room, it's, it's ultimately pride, but it looks like shame. It's not like, it's not like high-fisted, I don't need you. It's more like I'm embarrassed. If I really let you into my marriage, if you really saw how unhealthy our marriage is, I'm embarrassed by that. If you saw the debt I have on a credit card, I'm embarrassed by that. If you, if you really knew what I was looking at at night, I'm embarrassed by that. And I just break shame off in this room in the name of Jesus. I just break shame off. Shame that would somehow stop you from actually moving towards community. We break that off in the name of Jesus.